everyone, welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm taking my Wayback Machine to 1987 with a look back at DA3 City of the Gods. Before I begin, I'd just like to give a big shout out and thank you to all my patrons who so lovingly support the channel, especially so many of you who have been with me for a couple of years now and been extremely generous. I've put you in your own Hall of Fame. Your kind words and comments are always an inspiration to keep putting out more content. If you enjoy this video, please help me with my YouTube engagement algorithm and give this a like, comment, and share. Consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron or just leave a tip in my PayPal tip jar. Links in the description. Quick spoiler warning, I will be giving some in-depth reveals here, so if you intend to play, Grab your DM and point them to this review so perhaps they might decide to run it. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's begin. DA3 City of the Gods was released in 1987 and was written by Dave Ritchie and D&D co-creator Dave Arneson. In this module, the PC heroes are once again tasked with aiding the kingdom of Blackmoor to fight against its enemies at the behest of King Uther Andahar's chief spymaster university professor Fletcher William otherwise known as the Fetch. Once again, as in other modules of this series, the module uses the Comeback Inn to snatch heroes from the future in order to catch the king's enemies off guard through the use of powerful heroes who are unknown to them. I've already voiced my displeasure at the ease of access to a time machine and the can of worms that it opens. It just seems lazy from a storytelling perspective, but I understand why it was used. The in-between worlds is a contrivance so that each module can stand alone. If you've played the others, great, but if not, then here's how to get things started if you're new to Blackmoor. Once again, as in the other modules in this series, there is a ton of expository information given to the DM, which... Much of it is a retelling and a reprinting of events from the previous modules, with new information introduced. The Temple of the Frog from DA2 is assumed to have been destroyed, but the temple's high priest, St. Stephen, remains at large and is a major threat in this adventure. The primary task assigned to the heroes is to first investigate a mysterious metallic egg that has fallen from the sky and landed in an area known as as Benbar's Hectar. From there, they must travel to the Valley of the Ancients, where they will encounter the mysterious four-armed reptilian sand people, and ultimately their goal, the City of the Gods, where they are tasked with entering and trying to convince the gods within to aid Blackmoor against its many foes. It's an ambitious adventure, but like the other modules in the series, suffers in its execution, and many of the problems from DA1, Adventures in Blackmoor, resurface here, but are now multiplied. Really, I'm not sure how and why such a great premise could so catastrophically fail to live up to its potential, but I suspect that much of that is attributable to the tension between Dave Ritchie and Dave Arneson and TSR. I'm not really going to go into all the ins and outs of all this, but those who played in Arneson's original campaign have said Dave's City of the Gods was nothing like what was eventually released. What is also known is that Dave Arneson's name doesn't even appear in the final release module of the series, the Dutch F10, and there was a fifth module of the series planned, DA5, City of Blackmoor, which never saw release. As an aside, Zeitgeist Games released their own adventure module for their Blackmore series, City of the Gods, in 2003, in collaboration with Dave Arneson, and that module is said to have been closer to Dave's vision as to what DA3 turned out to be, but more on that in a moment. As for this module, however, it's clear that much of the inspiration derives once again from Star Trek, specifically the episode Bread and Circuses. In that episode, the SS Beagle is a merchant ship captained by R.M. Merrick, whom Kirk knew in his Academy days. Merrick's ship, the SS Beagle, suffers damage, and Captain Merrick and a few of his crew make their way to a nearby planet to recover ore needed for the ship's repairs. 
The planet turns out to be a sort of parallel Earth with 20th century Romans and televised gladiatorial games. Captain Merrick betrays his crew and violates the prime directive to assimilate himself into the Romanesque style culture as first citizen Merricus. Similarly, the ship, the FSS Beagle, a survey vessel tasked with the collection of flora and fauna from alien worlds around the galaxy by the Galactic Federation, encounters some sort of space anomaly and ends up crashing their ship in the Valley of the Ancients, not far from the Kingdom of Blackmoor. The captain of the Beagle, Bork Reisling, decides to adhere to the Federation non-interference directives and basically intends to put most of the crew in suspended animation and await rescue from the Federation. However, one of the crew, Stephen Rockling, discovers the weird energy shield around the planet, in essence magic, and decides that it's too great a discovery to go unexplored. He stages a mutiny and escapes in a shuttlecraft. That craft is shot down and crash lands in Lake Gloomin, where Rockling discovers the Temple of the Frog, and using the Federation's advanced technology, he and his surviving crewmates are able to assert themselves into the temple hierarchy as religious saints, with Rockling at its head, assuming the guise of St. Stephen. During the events of DA2 Temple of the Frog, the temple is destroyed, St. Stephen's fellow saints are killed, and Stephen himself is forced to flee into the swamps with a few surviving loyalists and mutated frog people. Meanwhile, on the FSS Beagle, Captain Reisling is experiencing problems of his own. Due to the unexpected mutiny, the captain begins to experience paranoid delusions, seeing plots and schemes everywhere where they don't exist, and setting his crew on edge. His delusions of mutiny ultimately set on a low-ranking crew member. The crewman panics and attempts to escape in a shuttle pod himself. Once again, it is shot down and crash lands. This time, however, when the poor crewman emerges, he is promptly killed by a local farmer due to a misunderstanding. It is this shuttle pod that the PC heroes are sent to investigate, and the adventure proper begins. As an aside, I find it amusing that the fictional beagle correlates to the real-life HMS beagle, an exploration vessel that was the home to naturalist and biologist Charles Darwin. It was Darwin's experiences while on board the vessel and the exploration of the Galapagos Islands that would years later lead to the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, which is considered the foundation of evolutionary biology. The investigation of the metallic egg will most likely result in the heroes gaining some new magic items or advanced technology. From there, they set out for the desert landscape of the Valley of the Ancients. Along the way, they encounter the seven-foot-tall, four-armed sandfolk, a silicone-based humanoid species, and are waylaid to a meeting with their leader, Donnell. It's quite likely with good role-playing they can arrive and meet with the desert leader and become honored guests, ultimately recruiting them to help in their attempt to reach the city of the gods. However, there are plots and schemes abound and Danelle's enemies might try to assassinate him and blame it on the heroes. Once they reach the city of the gods, the adventure comes to its conclusion with the heroes potentially gaining allies among the Beagle's disenfranchised crew and thus gaining new allies for the kingdom of Blackmoor. It's this final stage of the adventure, its climax, where they reach the titular city of the gods that the module disappoints in my humble opinion. Primarily due to the nature of the exploration of the crashed spaceship, here the author has decided to use an abstract representation of the ship using random tables to determine what locations are explored via elevator. The map provided, such that it is, is intended to be used to mark what location is which as the dice determine what has been discovered as shown by this chart here. This is all well and good, but the ship map provided is woefully undersized to the task, being only half a page. I find the graphical choices here bizarre. The ambush of the PCs by Darnell's men gets a full-page graphical map, and the encounter is potentially just a role-play encounter. The titular City of the Gods gets half a page? There certainly isn't a lot of room here to take notes, and what is marked on the ship map is in such small type that it's difficult to discern what is what. While certainly it's unreasonable to expect that the entire two-mile ship is fully detailed, 
I would only point out Gary Gygax's excellent expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which had a very similar premise, perhaps inspired by Dave Arneson's campaign, offers a massively detailed six-level zoo ship to explore. Certainly a few of the major areas from the Beagle could have been mapped. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks also came with a wonderful graphical book that can be shown to players as they move through the various encounters. Given the similarity of contents, such as robot guards and the like, a creative DM might grab a few of the encounter pictures from that module and use them to help bring the text wall presentation to life, especially in regards to some of the tech weapons and armor that the characters find. The 2004 Zeitgeist game version does something similar, providing quite a few mini-maps of the various ship systems and some very inventive encounters. So while there is a lot of fun to be had here with some interesting role-playing and combat encounters, the conclusion of the module ends up being a little anticlimactic and will require quite a bit of exposition from the DM to give this massive technological wonder the gravitas and sense of awe it deserves. The outstanding and inspiring cover art for this module is by Doug Chaffee, but like the cover art for Adventures in Blackmore has absolutely nothing to do with the adventure within. Once again, Jim Holloway is tasked with the interior artwork. The maps are done by Dennis Kalth and David Sutherland. As with other modules in this series, due to its status as a collector's item, eBay auctions have this listed with price tags going from $60 or more. Drive Through RPG has this listed for $5 for the PDF, but there is no print on demand option. And you also might want to check out the Zeitgeist Games version, which is also listed for $5 for the PDF. Links for both versions are in the description. So let's go ahead and check out DA3 City of the Gods on my D20 scale of style presentation and value. The style, like other modules in the series, is of course TSR's traditional mid-80s trade dress. The cover art is evocative, but doesn't accurately reflect the real contents of the module. Jim Holloway's interior artwork is great at portraying the various characters, but I don't find a lot of it very inspiring. Particularly the crashed spaceship Beagle is a far cry from Doug Chaffee's evocative cover. Then of course there are the maps. You have extremely detailed maps of Benbow's Hector, the ambush site and Danelle's camp, but the topography map south of Blackmoor and the map of the SS Beagle are given half a page each. Given that the SS Beagle is the entire point of the adventure, one can't help but wish that more care would have been given to its presentation. Really odd choices here. I'll rate this a 9. The adventure's presentation, like those in the series, once again delves into massive walls of text with little in the way of formatting that will allow the DM to refine important bits in the midst of an adventure. If I were to run this today, I'd have to take multiple colors of highlighter pens to it. That's not to say that I find the overall adventure bad. I think there is a lot of good here and that a DM can absolutely mine it for the best bits and discard the rest, but overall it falls short of the module's ambitious premise. I'll rate this a 13. Finally, let's talk value. Other than its status as a collector's item due to Dave Arneson's involvement, the eBay prices are hardly justified. The PDF is a great buy, of course. It's hard to argue with $5, and given the black and white nature of the thing, and coming in at only 50 pages is certainly viable, as a home printing project if one is so inclined, I'll rate this a 14. That brings my overall rating for DA3 City of the Gods to a 12 above average. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this review informative and useful. My exploration of the DA series of modules concludes next week with my review of DA4 The Duchy of Ten. And also use some of that sweet affiliate money and purchase the print-on-demand copy of Mutant Future from Goblinoid Games, so I'll have that for you as well. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout-out to all of my patrons. Your continued support makes these videos possible. If you enjoyed this module, please give it a like, comment, and share. Follow me on Twitter and join the channel's Facebook page, Dungeons & Dragons RPG Reviews. Consider supporting the channel and more content like this by becoming a patron yourself. 
or alternatively, you can just leave a tip in my PayPal tip jar. Links for everything is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.